Sometimes life is a little bit like baseball. You know, you're going along fairly well. Everything seems to be going in your favor. And then all of a sudden you're in the batter's box and a breaking ball comes in. You hit it and you don't know what's going to happen. It goes down the line. Sometimes it may curve into a foul ball. Other times it's in fair play and things take place that you never expected. And that's sort of like what happened to me right out of college in 1969. I was hired at Whippany Park High School to teach an area that I really enjoyed, electronics, in a federally funded program which required a licensed teacher. But at the same time, the Selective Service had other plans, giving me a 1A classification and a draft notice that came along in January. Well, I appealed it, and that was turned down. So my principal appealed it, and it was extended into the spring, and then my principal appealed it again, and my induction was stayed until the end of June. The end of June comes around, along with some reports that are not really positive when you're thinking about being drafted. For instance, Life magazine published the names and photographs of one week's death toll in Vietnam. And then there was that song by Kenny Rogers in the first edition about the guy who did his patriotic chore and went to that crazy Asian war and came home paralyzed and now was concerned that Ruby was leaving him. Kenny Rogers and the first edition. A year later, I would be in Saigon in the middle of a traffic jam and the guy driving the Jeep next to me said, you know, you're safer here than you are in Detroit. I don't know how true that was, but... That was something to think about. So I got my affairs in order and looked forward to the induction which would come. I got a card in the mail saying to report at 7.30 in the morning to the draft board on Ellison Street in Patterson on July 20th. I'm ready to go and then something else happens. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon. This is the culmination of a proposal set by John F. Kennedy in the early 60s. And it was such a great event that President Nixon declared it a federal holiday. I didn't report. Then a card comes in the mail reminding me that my induction has been postponed until Friday, July 25th. And there's nothing in the way of that one. My mother wakes me up early in the morning. I have my final home breakfast. We get in the car. My mother and my father, my aunt, the collie, and me all head off to the draft board down on Ellison Street. And we're in there reporting in. Attendance is being taken. Some toiletries are handed out by some benevolent groups. The Gideons were there handing out small Bibles. And the Patterson News was there for the obligatory photograph of guys being inducted into the military. There I am, for some reason, smiling. Don't know why, but I was just anticipating what would come next. We left the draft board on a bus, headed for the AFES station, that's Armed Forces Entrance Examination Station, in the Federal Building in Newark. And we're down there for the day, doing bits and pieces of things, at lunch, they sent us across the street to a, a nice little restaurant right next to the Federal Building. And I thought, well, this would be nice. You know, it's dark, a little music playing, tablecloths and silverware out. And we walk in with our lunch tickets. And the guy who seats people says, oh, you guys, you go down the stairs. And, and my hopes for a peaceful, quiet lunch were dashed as I got down the stairs and saw rows of tables, fluorescent lights, and these metal army trays. I was getting my first military meal in Newark. So we eat there, go back across the street, stuff some envelopes. As the afternoon goes on, they gather us with a whole bunch of other guys who had been inducted from draft boards around the state in a big room, and they swear us in to the U.S. military. After that, downstairs and out onto a public service bus, and we're on our way to Fort Dix, New Jersey. This was one of the strangest bus rides I think I've ever been on. I, I don't think one person spoke in the entire trip. We weaved our way through Newark, out to the turnpike, 
And all you could hear was the roar of the diesel in the back of the bus and the whining of the tires on the turnpike. And we get down to the exit for Fort Dix quickly, take a ride in a nice rural road. And as we're going in, it's becoming more and more military looking with chain link fences and signs that say restricted area. And then all of a sudden, a sign shows up. It's black letters on a white background. Fort Dix, New Jersey. An equal opportunity employer. That was so good for me to hear. And after that, a more elegant sign with gold leaf letters against a black background saying, Fort Dix, home of the ultimate weapon. And I thought, this is my chance. This is where I'm going to excel. I got the communications license. I got the electronics background. I'm going to be working with missiles. Well, my view of the ultimate weapon and Fort Dick's view of the ultimate weapon were entirely different. You see, Fort Dix, I was the ultimate weapon. Basic training, the infantrymen, the guys who go in and do the final cleanup, making sure there aren't any insurgents left after the bombs drop. That's what I was going to be. As far as the U.S. Army was concerned, I could probably be classified as an M46 Montgomery. I mean, really. That was it. And the bus weaves its way into Fort Dix, and we come to the reception station. And this was an entirely different reception than I've ever been in before. Usually receptions that I went to had a little bit of cake, maybe some punch, uh, an opportunity to mingle, music in the background. This was an old building. It was immaculately painted and clean, but... There were nothing but benches there, and a representative from the fort came out and greeted us and reminded us that if we had any illegal weapons, we needed to turn them in immediately or face the stockade. And I thought, well, (laughs) who would bring an illegal weapon to the U.S. Army? A couple guys get up, and they're dropping these switchblades in a box. Yeah. After that, they march us out. We start on our Army career, marching. Wherever you went, In basic training, you marched. They marched us over to a supply room where they got us bedding. And of course they got us a hat because you're out of uniform in the Army if you're not wearing a hat. So we have our hats. We have our bedding. And they take us over to the reception station barracks. These are leftovers from the Second World War. Old buildings that are immaculately kept again. But... These were the great equalizers. You walk into an unfinished room, bunk beds, and down on the end, there's something that we heard about, maybe read about, but never really saw. And that was the latrine, the bathroom, the great equalizer. Walking in there, you see a row of sinks with mirrors made out of shiny metal. And behind them and off to the side are toilets. Now, these toilets don't have any dividers. They're just sitting there. Bathrooms used to be a place where a lot of people would go and sit and think or something like that. But here you just went in and went out. I walked in there one day during my stay in the reception area and it looked like a toilet jury sitting there. All these guys occupying these these stools. It's just amazing. And we're over there shaving. Off to the side is this little dark, dank area, which is a shower. There was one guy in the shower. He came out. He says, this place is pretty neat. I said, really? He says, yeah, back home. i got to take a bath in the creek. So, you know, the barracks were sort of like an equalizer. They were in a step up for some people, for others uh, rather uh, step down in, in the way we used to live. By this time, we had combined with even larger groups. There were reservists, there were enlistees, all in the reception area waiting to see what would come up. We go to sleep that night. Everybody's quiet. Everybody's anxious, wondering what's going to happen next. We wake up to something that I had never heard before. Army cadence and a special cadence waking us up around 5.30 in the morning. At that point, I wasn't quite sure what an airborne ranger was. Guys who had been there a day before us were marching along, making a lot of noise early in the morning. We had breakfast, we meet a guy 
who's our sergeant, who's taking care of us during our stay at the reception station. He takes us out of breakfast and we go get our hair cut. Yes, I was wondering when it would happen. The two-minute haircut that came along and took everything off. I ran my hands through my head, and it felt like a peach. And the guy didn't get all the hairs. There was a couple long ones there in a couple places. And I looked in a mirror, and you know, I have kind of a round head anyway. And with no hair on it, I looked like Charlie Brown from Peanuts. After that, we were marched over to another supply room, and we went through this chain of events where we first get a duffel bag and then they march us through and give us our entire allotment of clothes for the basic training experience. So we go through that, come out, and then spend the weekend, what's left of it, at the reception station waiting to see what would come up next week, which would be more time for testing to see what we would be most qualified for in military service. And that was the beginning of my army career. We would march everywhere, and sometimes the cadences were cynical in nature, reminding us that we were now U.S. Ain't Army no property. Use looking down. Ain't no use in looking down. Ain't no discharge on the ground. Ain't no discharge on the ground. Ain't no use in down. Ain't no use in looking down. Ain't no discharge on the ground. Ain't no discharge on the ground. Ain't no use in looking back.